Our African trip starts from Atlanta to Amsterdam. We stay five days in Amsterdam to recover from the nine hour time change. We had a great time in Amsterdam and now are ready to start our African safari. However, it's another long nine hour flight on KLM Royal Dutch Airlines. The airline provides each passenger with her own private entertainment system. This helped the time go by as we watched several movies of our own choice. We landed at the Kilimanjaro Airport late at night. We did plane the old fashioned way by walking down the portable stairs onto the tarmac. It was dark, so you could not see any of the surroundings. Our OAT tour leader, Dowdy, was waiting for us after we cleared customs. We boarded a small bus and started our way to Arusha City. On the way, you can see Mount Kilimanjaro in the distance when it is daylight and not covered in clouds. It is over 19,000 feet high and a popular climbing adventure. This is the route we took to Arusha City and the drive took an hour and a half. The next day, we pack up for our 12 days on a safari visiting three different reserves. These are the three Toyota Land Cruisers that we will spend most of our time in viewing the game. We drive from Arusha City to the east entrance of the Tarangar National Park. It is about 100 miles and it only takes us a couple of hours. We reach the park entrance and stop for lunch before we start on our game drive. So this is it, our first safari experience and we are excited about what we might see. I bought a new camera just for this trip, and so did Bob. Two warthogs dart out in front of us and off into the bush. What's that mean? When they are startled, they run very fast with their tails straight up and they have a face only their mothers could love. We stop to watch some impalas, which is a medium-sized African antelope. This is going to be a beautiful picture. Oh, look at their behinds. Look how pretty they are. Here, look at this bird right here. Sue spots a northern white-crowned shrike on a branch. This large column of mud is a termite hill with a lilac-breasted roller on top. We catch up with the other two land cruisers and take an opportunity to photograph ourselves. A giraffe gingerly strolls out in front of us with its lengthy legs as it walks across the trail. Next, we spot some zebras. Those sound like donkeys. Those mules. It's calling them for something. Coming up now. Who's the stallion? This is a large group of female impalas, and the impalas is one of the most popular animals in this part of East Africa. Here are a couple of male impalas that have been barred from the group, especially the females. We got to see some monkeys climbing down from a tree. However, the babies had a jarring time at it. This guy stands up on his hind legs for a pose for us. We stop to watch a progression of elephants walk right in front of us. Oh my gosh. At this watering spot, there are all kinds of animals getting a drink. You have the Marlboro stork. Notice some of the storks have stored undigested food hanging in a pouch in their throats. There are zebras, and in the distance there are some monkeys and elephants on their way. The giraffes with countless birds are coming down for a drink too. This is Africa's weirdest tree, the baobab, and sometimes called the upside down tree because it looks like its roots are up in the air. The baobab tree and its bark is one of the sources of food for the elephants. The tree trunk is soft and very fibrous. This hole is from elephants eating all the way to the hollow center, which makes a nice home for some other critters. Vultures are circling overhead. This means it's only time before they descend on an unfortunate corpse. Here we have a wildebeest being eaten by several white-headed vultures. Notice that there is one Marlboro stork trying to cut in on the feast. The vultures posture for their position and try to run off the stork, but to no avail. Notice the stork's food pouch expanding as he eats. This is where the pecking order came. Yeah. <laughs> Literally, yes. Here we see some water bucks cautiously walking into a watering hole. Despite its name, 
The water buck does not spend much time in the water, but will take refuge there to escape predators. We all stop on top of a bluff to take a look down into the lowlands where we spot some more elephants. We drive down to get a closer look. Sally and Sue are standing on the seats for a better view of a bull elephant as it rambles straight towards us. During this trip, we focus on getting a few close-ups of the animal's eyes, especially Bob Cousy. Baby elephants nurse for the first two years of their lives. After it is born, the first thing that the calf does is wobble in search for its mother's milk. It drinks about 10 liters of milk every day. The elephant uses his leg to break the roots free. It takes a calf a year or more to control its trunk and learn its many uses. We stop again this time to watch some baboons in the tree. Next we come upon a large herd of Cape Buffalo. They do a great job of staring you down. This is the southeast entrance of the park where we entered and we drove all around observing the animals. The park is over 1,000 square miles. Our campsite was on the other side of the reserve next to Lake Burungi. We stayed at this tented campsite for two days. Each couple had their own private tent mounted on a wooden platform a few feet above the ground. There was a nice porch to read, or watch and listen to the wildlife. The inside had running water, a warm shower, and flush toilet. At the end of the day, our tour leader, Dowdy, would have a campfire and we'd talk about what we saw. Did we all enjoy our morning game viewing? Yes. yes. And what was the highlight of the day? Karen? After that, it was time for dinner. Our OAT tour included a day in the life of a Maasai village, during which we learned a great deal about the Maasai people, getting a chance to directly interact with them. We were greeted by the Maasai women in traditional style. Neck movements accompanied the singing. Later, the women in our group join in on the singing and dancing. She <laughs> will be over 90 years old. This is the village leader and they draw raw blood from a cow's juggler vein for his health, a customary Maasai ritual. A bow is constructed and a small arrow with a hypodermic tip is shot into the cow's juggler vein. This takes precise aiming. Once punctured, the blood is collected in a leather flask. We are offered to drink some raw blood, but we all decline. However, Dowdy takes a drink. Every 15 years, Maasai warriors retire to make room for the new generation. The young successors undergo a series of trine initiation rituals. Every seven years or so, a new and individually named generation of warriors are initiated. This involves most boys between 12 and 19 who have reached puberty and are not part of the previous age set. Paramount amongst the rite of passage is the act of ceremonial circumcision, which is performed without anesthetic the final step to awake into manhood. The boy must endure the operation in silence. Any expressions of pain bring dishonor. The healing process takes three to four months. The young men wear dark clothes and painted faces. During this period, the newly circumcised young men are not allowed back into their village and must roam about out in the wilds. However, they do sleep in a small campsite right outside the village built by their mothers. After our visit at the Maasai village, we leave the Lake Burungi tenant camp and head to the Taluma Lodge in Karatu. This trip took only a couple of hours, and on our way, we pass the Obama bus. We arrived at the Taluma Lodge early afternoon. We continued on paved roads until we started to climb up to the rim of the Ngorongoran crater. 
We stopped for a scenic view on the crater, and in a few days, we will be back here to explore what is down there. We continue driving on the rim, and then down to the high flat plains. On our way to the Serengeti, we take a short detour to the Olduvai Gorge for lunch. Here we visit a small archaeological museum as one of the local guides provide a brief history on the findings here by Lewis and Mary Leakey. Scientists believe that Africa was the birthplace of man. Uh, I would like to explain you about the old Bible. The Leakeys and others found thousands of fossilized remains of early man in this gorge, including the oldest Homo habilis and Homo erectus. This chart shows the five types of hominids and all but the earliest were found in this gorge. This is a landmark view of the Olduvite Gorge monolith divided up into five layers or beds. More hominid fossils had come from bed one than any of the other beds. The best known is a skull that Mary Leakey found at the FLK site in 1959. The skull of an Australopithecus bonsai that was 1.8 million years old. We are going to that site right now. So this is the nearest site with over 700 sites. Mm -hmm. uh, this gorge. The gorge is very long. And they don't do any more work here? No more any work here because under that one here is lava, the black rocks. Ah. After our lunch and tour of the Old Divide Gorge, we continued on to the Serengeti. If you look closely, you can see something in that tree. It is a Thompson gazelle dead in the tree. Show Cut is one of our guides and he explains that when a Thompson gazelle is ready to die, it climbs a tree. However, most likely a leopard is hiding its prey from other would-be predators. For example, take a close look at this tree. That movement in the tree is a leopard eating a Thompson gazelle. The leopard takes a break from lunch and moves down onto a lower branch to provide a better view for us. Let's check out the monkeys. She was kissing his bottom. Right here. And she just picked him up with both hands. <laughs> That's cute. Here's a giraffe eating acacia branches, thorns and all. They must have an extremely durable tongue and digestive system. We stop at a large hippo pond and listen to Shokut explain about the hippo. That's the reason these animals have the small ears. When they go down, they close the ears to avoid water. No. I know, that size. So they come out for grazing. For those people coming from one village to another during the night, you encounter an hippo, they'll charge you. And they have those fangs for about a foot long. We stop to watch a lioness stalk three warthogs. She is very still downwind, and the warthogs are about 50 yards away under a tree. A tour guide radios to the other land cruisers and before long there is a large audience for the kill. The unexpecting warthogs start to move closer to the lioness. The lioness slowly sneaks up upon the warthogs. The baby warthog is straying away from the others and is only 10 yards from being lunch. There she goes! but for some reason stops. The warthogs see her now, but they appear to be unconcerned and just walk off. Interesting. The next day is our Serengeti Sunrise Hot Air Balloon Ride. For the takeoff, the basket is lying on its side. It takes several minutes for enough hot air to fill the balloon before it starts to rise. Finally, the balloon lifts the basket upright and off we go. Keep your camera 
our way and hold on. We initially ascended up over 1,000 feet as we soar above one of the balloons. This is one of the rare views of the top side of a giraffe. We are coming up upon a small stream. If you look closely, you can see a few small birds sitting on his back. Look at that. Next, we come upon three more hippos crossing the stream. Oh, look on the water. Oh, look at all of them bobbing the water. Oh, to the left. We come across more Thompson gazelles. The sound of the balloon's jet scares them off and they run for their lives. Look how fast these gazelles run. They can reach speeds up to 50 miles per hour and turn on a dime. We are getting lower and lower and now are only a few feet above the ground. This is where all the passengers lie down on the basket floor and hold on for dear life. That is why you can't see any of us in this view. We hit the ground with a thud and the balloon drags us for another 100 yards or so. However, before the balloon is fully collapsed, a puff of wind tips us over and we land on our side. Well, we survived the 50 minute, 10 mile balloon ride, a once in a lifetime experience. The next day, we are awakened by a large herd of elephants passing right outside our camp. We were fortunate that they did not trample over the land cruisers and our tents. Later on during our morning expedition, we came upon more elephants. As you can see, they leave a path of destruction with the trees toppled over. We drive directly under a large tree with a young male lion sitting in it. We parked a land cruiser about 20 feet away for a better view. If it wanted to, it could easily have jumped into our land cruiser and had its choice for lunch. We were able to get several amazing photos of this beautiful beast as he looks directly at us. We stop our land cruisers to watch a lioness take her morning stroll. Then a couple of more lioness show up. We all get out our binoculars to watch. At first, we didn't notice the two cubs down in the tall grass. The mothers are very attentive and look for any signs of danger for their young ones. They carefully walk single file across the road as the little cubs playfully hop across the trail. Next, we spot several cheetahs sitting off in the distance on two large mounds. This is the closest we ever get to the cheetahs. You can see the cheetahs are smaller than the lions and leopards. They have a small head and do not do well against the other large cats. Here are more lionesses with their cubs playing with each other. The cubs look playful as one of them hears us and stops to look. The mother continues on as the cub runs to catch up with his mom. Take a close look at this tree. There is a leopard balanced on a branch. On two occasions, our guide pointed out a black mama on the road in front of us. However, each time all you can see is something on the road and poof, it has gone into the weeds. The main reason why they do not let us out of the Land Cruiser during our game drive is due to this snake. They are Africa's most venomous snake at 14 feet long and it is the fastest snake in the world. A bite from this fearsome serpent is 100% fatal, usually within about 20 minutes. Unlike what the guides told us, that we had about two hours before death. Maybe time to fly in a doctor with the anti-venom. We come upon another group of lions sitting on a gigantic rock. They're resting there after a hard day of work. Here are a couple of dick dicks. They are small antelopes with very large eyes. This baby gazelle does not have much chance of surviving out in the happened. wild since his main defense is running. We head back to the camp after a long day of game viewing. These are our tents at the Serengeti campsite. Each couple has a private tent. This is our tent and we get ready for a nice hot shower before dinner. We let the camp attendant know and he pours warm water into the shower bucket. 
Each day before dinner, we have a campfire and talk about what we saw. However, this night, when Dowdy was starting the fire, he noticed full-grown lion prints in the dirt. I thought this is what they tell all the tourists, since we would not know the difference. Bob and I took photos of each of us at the campfire. The sun sets, and we go to the dinner mess tent. At dinner, all of a sudden, there's some commotion right outside our tent, and the camp staff comes running in from outside. A full-grown black mane lion walks right outside our mess tent down the road. The guides get into the land cruisers to scare them away. After dinner, they escort us back to our tents and told us to stay inside and turn off the lights. However, getting to sleep that night was something special and was a highlight for me of the entire trip. Night, Rex. Night, John boy. Early the next morning, we drive from the Serengeti camp to the Ngorongoron crater. By the way, our camp guide mentioned that the lion came back with three of its friends last night. It is very dusty down in the crater, so we wear our bandana mask. The Ngorongoron mountain once rivaled Kilimanjaro in size, over 19,000 feet high. The Ngorongoron crater was formed from volcanic eruptions. Instead of the lava running out the sides of the volcano, it filled the volcano and formed a solid lid, which subsequently collapsed when the molten rock subsided, creating the cauldron you see today. The circular crater is 12 miles across with steep walls over 2,000 feet. The crater's rim is 7,500 feet above sea level. We reach the floor of the crater and notice how flat it is. There are no trees in sight, so there are no giraffes in the crater. We come across two warthogs fighting for dominancy of this territory. They got their tusks locked together. Out in the distance, the group of zebras at the very top of the screen is being chased by a lion. Something about this crater gets the animals upset. Here are two zebras being rebellious. See how they try to push each other down as they run in circles. The winning zebra bucks his legs to let the others know he is the alpha male. Here are the hippos out of the water next to their pond. Where are they running now? A close-up of a hippo in the pond as you can only see his eyes. Here's a photo sequence of a few black beak ibis flying over the hippos. A spotted hyena is on top of that hill. Here's a close-up of one taking a nap. You can see the drool matted on his fur. Next, we see a running jackal. Next, we come upon two male black mane lions taking an afternoon nap. These are very similar to what visited us at the Serengeti camp last night. Boy, was that terrifying and yet exhilarating. One lion gets up to take a look, but goes back down to finish his nap. On the way out of the crater, we see some baboons on the side of the road. We exit the crater and take the 30 minute drive back to the same Talama Lodge we were at five days ago. However, this time we have a separate duplex cottage for the next two nights. Notice the sausage tree outside our duplex. We get ready for another great dinner at the Talama Lodge. The next day we will head back to Arusha City and onto the airport for our flight back to the US. But first, we stop at some gift shops for souvenirs. Here's Bob and Leslie's Big Five set and our giraffes safely at home. Our flight home had three stops and took around 23 hours total of flying time. Seeing Africa was the best experience we ever had. It should definitely be on your bucket list.